Hello, everyone, and welcome to New America's second webinar on housing in the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Tim Robustelli, and I'm a program associate with the Future of Property Rights Program at New America. Our program aims to help solve today's property rights challenges at home and abroad. And through our work, we strive to connect new constituencies and shed light on underreported issues in the property rights space. Today, we'll be discussing the housing implications of the COVID-19 pandemic and local responses. I'm fortunate to be joined by a wonderful panel of experts. Amy Nelson, Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, based in Indianapolis. Dan Cornelis, Director of Community and Economic Development for Forsyth County, North Carolina, based in Winston-Salem. And Joanna Carr, Research and Policy Coordinator for the Arizona Housing Coalition, based in Phoenix. Welcome and thank you for making time uh, to discuss this critical topic during these hectic days. To all our viewers, we'll start with about 45 minutes of panel discussion and save some time at the end for audience Q&A. Before we jump into the current crisis, uh, can each of you tell our viewers in a few words what your organizations do? We'll start with Amy. Thanks. The Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is a nonprofit advocacy-based organization that works specifically to address fair housing issues or housing discrimination. But we're the only such organization in the entire state of Indiana. So as a result of that, we also work on broader public policy issues uh, as it relates to housing as well. Dan? Forsyth County, uh, Department of Community and Economic Development provides services in housing rehabilitation. Uh, we enforce a minimum housing code. Uh, we do have uh, multiple home ownership programs and down payment assistance. Uh, we also are active in economic development, everything from workforce development to incentive packages and other community development uh, endeavors as they present themselves. Thanks. Joanna? Uh, so the Arizona Housing Coalition is a statewide member organization whose mission is to lead in the efforts to end homelessness and advocate for safe, affordable housing for all Arizonans. We operate under three pillars, which are um, advocacy, education, and collaboration. Advocacy and collaboration is the forefront of the support um, to our members at the moment um, during the COVID-19 crisis with efforts particularly at the um, state level and support to our members serving on the front lines in shelters and housing services. Wonderful. And to provide a bit of context on each of your cities for all of our viewers, uh, could the three of you briefly share what housing related issues are present and how the current pandemic has exacerbated these issues? Uh, we'll start again with Amy. Well, Probably our particular issues aren't unique to what a lot of cities have been grappling, grappling with across our country. Indianapolis, however, is one of the highest evicting cities in the country. It's number 14 for actual eviction filings, and then it's number two for actual court-ordered evictions. In addition to that, we've also had a series of press uh, stories and broader discussion about substandard housing because we've been dealing with uninhabitable housing that tenants are in, particularly with out-of-state landlords where they can't get remediation for that. And in some ways are retaliated against it when they contact public health or uh, contact legal services. And then of course, we have housing discrimination as well, which has never gone away. And we continue to battle and, you know, and fight on that. And then finally, we have an affordability crisis uh, that certainly is not, again, not unique to our particular city, but that combination of things now adding COVID into it and the risk of people losing our housing through no fault of their own is um, extremely problematic. Dan? Over the years, Winston-Salem has had a very affordable rental uh, housing it, the problem has not been much in rental, but we've seen some very exaggerated prices rise in the last year. 
Uh, our downtown is really coming on strong and we're building a lot more high end uh, apartment units, but uh, are losing some of our low end ones. There's a real fear of gentrification in some of our neighborhoods as our downtown spreads. Um, our home ownership prices have gone up uh, quite a bit. From, we were averaging for years and years about $120,000 for a first time home buyer. And now it's crop, cropped up to about 170,000. So that's not a big jump, but it's a big jump within the last year or two. Go so ahead. in Arizona, um, I mean, homelessness has been on the rise in the city of Phoenix um, with a clear increase in our pit count um, over the last four years. So in 2020, um, 7,419 um, individuals were identified on the pit count. Um, and we are in the midst of a serious affordable housing crisis um, in Arizona itself. So 73% of extremely low income households are severely rent burdened and spending 50% of their income on housing costs. Within the city of Phoenix, um, the city of Phoenix recently um, did a, um, a housing data search and they found that 46% of households within the city actually fell into that extremely low income bracket um, and 65% um, were low to moderate or below. So it kind of shows the, the extent of the, the affordable crisis and um, the, the population that Phoenix are dealing with. So prior to COVID-19, organizations were striving forward um, and were collaborating um, across municipal levels and with um, nonprofit organizations. The mayor, just prior to the extent of the breakout, uh, so the outbreak, um, had called for a joint regional approach and a homeless plan for the area um, with the support of the governor and the city of Phoenix for working on an affordable housing initiative. Um, so now, I mean, I can, I can say that um, the city um, municipality and the organizations have been really sidelined by the current crisis. So we're all kind of grappling at the moment to find the solutions to, to meet the immediate need. Um, and we're obviously facing with the high homeless population, um, a challenge in, in putting forward the adequate protections um, and also um, identifying solutions to, to keep people in their homes amidst the, the unemployment that's occurring. Great, uh, thank you all for setting the stage a bit uh, for the rest of this discussion. And I'm certain that all of these problems that you've touched on are, are not unique to your city as they can be found throughout the country. Um, so last week, FPR spoke with Diane Yentl, uh, president and CEO of the National Low Income Housing Coalition about the congressional stimulus package and some of its implications for housing. So now I'd really like to focus on state, county, and local level responses. Joanna, uh, start with a question for you. Arizona lawmakers recently passed their own $50 million emergency bill. Uh, why did the state supplement federal action and how does the bill target housing? Okay, so the bill was added as part of a deal um, between Republican and Democratic leadership in the Senate, um, and they wanted to develop a bare bones spending plan prior to recess. Um, leadership anticipated that there'd be a gap in federal funding um, to address the pandemic. And so knowing that we already have such a huge problem in the state with housing and homelessness, the Senate wanted Ar an Arizona focused approach while we awaited details of the federal stimulus. Um, and in terms of how it helps, the bill um, will be targeting three priorities relating to housing. Um, firstly, um, payments to prevent eviction that will be allocated through the Arizona Department of Housing. Um, number two is to fund shelters who provide services to individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, and $5 million have been, has been approved to be appropriated to um, DES to support the shelters in that effort. Um, and within that effort, the focus is going to be on temporary isolation and quarantine housing, sanitation supplies and services, um, and other resources as needed. Um, and finally, the bill will be addressing food insecurity. So $1 million has been appropriated again to DES to provide immediate assistance to food banks um, through existing infrastructure and an additional $750,000 to support additional food insecurity programs. And then what 
we're also doing because um, that's around um, just over 6,000 million of the 50,000 that's been appropriated. The Arizona Housing Coalition is working on developing some policy recommendations for the remaining funds. Um, and that will be including rental assistance paid directly to landlords um, and staffing and coordination within the temporary shelters along with transportation, which is a huge issue right now within Phoenix. Um, and just in, in addition to the 50 million, um, on March 30th, the Arizona Department of Housing Joanna, I think you may have muted yourself by accident. So, um, so I was just saying that um, the Department of Housing opened um, $5 million from the existing housing trust fund um, and a eviction prevention program went into effect on March 30th. So that's kind of the state um, funding overview right now. Great, thank you. Uh, certainly seems like a lot of action at the state level in Arizona. Uh, Amy, yeah. to, to you, activity has been a bit different in Indiana with Governor Eric Holcomb recently vetoing a housing related bill under the pandemic. Can you tell us a bit more what that was all about? Yeah, unlike what our great colleagues in Arizona have been able to proactively do, unfortunately, we were having quite the battle here in Indiana to not take things backward when it comes to housing, um, the different housing needs. So as I mentioned before, Indianapolis has had a number of different housing barriers and impediments related to habitability, uh, related to affordability and evictions. Starting last summer, the Indianapolis mayor Hogsett had started working on the, a potential for an ordinance to try to address some of these issues. And it wasn't until this year that the city council was able to pass that ordinance, which included things like a requirement that housing providers had to provide attached to their lease information about tenants' rights, like their access to legal assistance services, their right to contact public health, um, items such as that. And then it also had fees for retaliation, fines for retaliation, if a housing provider retaliated against a tenant for them simply contacting public health about a habitability issue or legal services within that. And it had those fines that were addressed in there and it had a number of other features within the ordinance as well. So that was passed at the city level and immediately, um, actually the day of, the Indiana General Assembly amended a bill that was unrelated to um, this particular topic, but amended the bill to preempt cities from basically anything that involved them being able to have any authority over the landlord tenant relationship. And it was literally that broad um, in that. And that was viewed as fairly controversial because it was at the end of session, added into an unrelated bill, and it was added in basically during conference committee. So no public testimony essentially was able to be given as well. Um, we were part of a broad effort, um, over 300 groups that very quickly came together and really try to make clear how devastating that this would be. Um, this was pre-COVID really, um, really showing um, its potential impact. And so this was about mid-March. Um, unfortunately, the Indiana General Assembly passed the bill, SEA 148. So then we moved to um, trying to get the mayor or the governor Holcomb to veto the bill. And after um, some pressure, uh, we were very pleased to see Governor Holcomb uh, veto the bill and only his second veto of his administration. Um, this is a good lesson in always make, not only watching what your local city is doing, but also watching the General Assembly as well. And you know, being able to pull groups together very quickly to try to address something because we figure this bill will be back in the next session. Thank you. And Amy, I just want to follow up on something you touched on a little bit. Indiana is not unique in the fact that Democratic or blue cities are often at odds with Republican or, or more red state leadership. How do you see this dynamic further impacting housing related responses during the crisis? Well, for the crisis, our General Assembly now is is not scheduled to meet. They are they do not um, are not there through the whole year. They have long and short sessions, typically from January to April or March within there. Um, they'll be back basically in November. 
So the discussion is certainly being there. And in some ways, it's an opportunity for all of us to highlight just how important housing is. And that, and that COVID is really exasperating the public health crisis when people do not have access to stable, affordable housing. And so in some ways, that's gonna you know, be how we need to make clear, use it as an opportunity to educate decision makers about the need of housing and how legislation like 148 is completely detrimental to that effort. And making sure too that we work with housing providers. Uh, we certainly you know, want to work with them to try to find uh, things that we could possibly you know, agree upon within that. Um, and it's our hope that maybe that will happen. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, to turn to you, um, in relation to discussions around landlord-tenant dynamics, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really brought issues around eviction to the forefront with widespread job loss, putting a lot of pressure on renters. Could you speak a bit about any eviction prevention measures in Winston-Salem? Who was behind these decisions? Who was covered and how the policies are communicated? Even before COVID-19 uh, was coming down on us, there was concern about the increased number of evictions in Forsyth County. We have a very caring community and, and folks were worried about the number of evictions and, and how they were happening. Um, the, there was a call uh, as the, the virus hit us, the, the, the mayor of Winston-Salem called for a moratorium and he was joined by the sheriff in requesting a moratorium on evictions. Uh, there were some questions about the leg legality of that, but then the Chief Justice of North Carolina stepped in and shut down all the courts. Uh, and they shut down almost everything uh, that the court proceeds, in, in, including the eviction. So they were shut down. And so they were shut down until I think uh, it was uh, like 30 days that that would have been. I think we're coming upon that here shortly, maybe the 14th, I think, or a little bit later of, of April. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out once the courts are back open again and evictions uh, are open again. There was some question too of some evictions that had started before the uh, courts talked about it. And um, so they, th there's some folks that are saying that evictions are still occurring, but they're very rare right now. And the people that were behind it were um, a lot of advocates here in the county that, that we look at the continuum of care and a lot of folks were worried about those folks becoming homeless and adding to the already uh, numerous uh, homeless folks that we have. And so they, um, what they're concerned about now is what happens after the moratorium is off and maybe um, how we deal with eviction. And because these folks are gonna have to pay most likely their past rent and then have rent due. And who knows how much past rent you have and how much will be due. So. Uh, they're trying to look for solutions that may help that eviction process to, to um, not have such a d disastrous effect on our, uh, our residents. Uh, I think there's been some talk about maybe getting some legal representation at the, um, the hearings when the eviction hearings and uh, trying to talk with landlords about maybe uh, selling for a little bit less money than they otherwise would. And uh, we're looking for some funds um, that may be coming in. I will tell you this, uh, Forsyth County, once the same Forsyth County uh, has developed a uh, fund, a $3 million fund, a little bit over $3 million, and it's being run through our Winston-Salem uh, how's it, our, our Winston-Salem Foundation, and they will be delivering funds out to nonprofits to give to folks that are eligible, and hopefully that will help some of the folks with their rent uh, once this moratorium is over. Great, thanks. And I do want to loop back in a bit to that imp important point you made about the end of the moratoriums and, and past due rent and how uh, low income renters and other vulnerable people can deal with that. But before I do, I'd like to bring Joanna and Amy back in and ask if there have been any uh, similar measures surrounding eviction in, in Phoenix and Indianapolis. Amy? For us here in Indianapolis, what we have had is the city of Indianapolis, part of that proposal that I talked about earlier, um, set aside about, I think it was $250,000 for additional legal assistance for people confronting eviction. 
So that's been the first step, um, certainly by the city of Indianapolis. We haven't seen that on a statewide basis, but cities in Fort Wayne and South Bend are also evaluating similar provisions. This again was pre-COVID uh, and we'll have to kind of see how those other cities um, move forward. Um, and for Arizona, um, very similar to Dan's community, um, on March 24th, we had an executive order um, from the governor on um, eviction enforcement suspensions. Um, so any tenant that's received um, any notification of, of legal hearings or court documentation can issue their landlord with a COVID-19 tenant notice to request a suspension of the, um, the eviction or the writ of restitution. Um, so courts across the state uh, adopted various practices to, to deal with this change. But again, um, we are obviously concerned about the fallout of that um, because it's not a um, suspension on rent, it's just the, the control of the enforcement of eviction. But I know we're gonna go on to that in a moment. Great, thanks. And I just have to quickly follow up and ask about any policies related to mortgage payments and foreclosure because, you know, there's concern around tenants paying rents, but a lot of times landlords and especially low volume landlords rely on that rent to pay their mortgages. Has there been any movement around mortgages uh, in any three of your states or cities? I'm seeing as far as Sorry, as far as we're aware within um, Arizona, there's no new policy or program regarding mortgage um, foreclosure, but we do have an existing foreclosure assistance program, which the Department of Housing um, are sort of putting on the, the forefront of their website and communicating that that is available to any homeowners that are, that are at risk. Thanks, and I saw a shake of the head from Amy. Dan, anything on your end? Yeah, we, we are fortunate to have the Center for Home Ownership in, in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, and they work with folks that are having struggles with their mortgage payments. Uh, we went through a, a lot of uh, foreclosures back in the last uh, crisis we had when we had the banking crisis, and we were, we were up losing close to 110 homes a month of foreclosures. And so we, we have some uh, counselors that are really good at working with folks that, you know, they had some buyouts at the end of the state of North Carolina came through and helped out. And, I did notice that um, Fannie and Freddie Mac at the, the federal level are forgiving or deferring payments uh, for the next two months. And I think they're just packing them out to the backside of the mortgage. But I think that will be real helpful in this crisis too. So we're looking at all, all kinds of solutions um, that we may be able to use with some of the federal money coming forth. Great, thanks. Um, and to, to circle back to a point, uh, Dan made, and um, it's something that I, I saw in Arizona as well with Governor Doug Ducey. It's that he's placed a moratorium on evictions for 120 days, but again, it's my understanding that once this measure is lifted, tenants will owe any past due rent. Uh, Joanne, I'd like to ask, have you seen any solutions put in place or any solutions proposed to ease this burden when it comes? Sure. So, um, yeah, obviously that's been a concern of our communities and what happens after the 120 days when the rent is still, still due um, and the landlords can move forward with the risk of restitution. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Department of Housing had um, brought forward an eviction prevention program using existing funds from the Housing Trust Fund. So the hope is that um, tenants will use that fund um, to mitigate the, the risk of um, eviction down the line and the fund is um, actually very flexible in that it's available to all Arizona residents as long as they are um, at or below 100% of AMI and they don't need a court order or a notice um, and so tenants can use it um, if their income has been impacted by COVID-19. Um, there, are, there are a few requirements that they have to pay um, 30 percent of their income towards the rent um, and also any stimulus funds that are owed them such as the unemployment um, bolster or the individual payments will count towards that um, so yeah I'd say that the Department of Housing have been proactive in in getting that fund together um, and we're, we also really want to work on some tenant education to make sure that tenants are 
fully aware that the rent is still due um, and are aware of all of the um, resources and financial um, financial resources that are available to help them to pay the rent and also to communicate the importance of landlord-tenant communication during this time. Um, I think it's really an opportunity for um, landlord and tenant education around this issue and how the, um, the executive order works along with all the funding. Yeah, and I should jump in and say that our governor, like many others, has put an eviction moratorium on. And there is actually a press conference going on right now. Um, our moratorium was, is supposed to expire on April 6th, and I believe it's getting extended. Um, that was going to potentially get brought up in the press conference here today. But I agree with Joanna. It's an opportunity that we really need to be educating tenants and most of them know that this rent is going to be coming due. What can be done to try to ensure that people don't lose housing because they simply don't have income right now? And when that rent comes due after the moratorium ends, whenever that might be, um, is just going to be critical. Um, and I just want to add to that also um, a really important piece that I know is happening in our community with the um, PHAs and the housing program operators. Throughout the month of March, they were um, most certainly working proactively to engage with their tenants um, and to ask if there's been any income loss to make the adjustments um, to their contribution. So I think that's been really key, hopefully, to not see so much of a fallout from um, tenants and rapid re rehousing programs and um, other subsidy programs. Thanks both. Uh, Dan, any, any thoughts on your end? Well, I just say this, I, I think if you're going to have a real exodus of folks being evicted at some point in time, somebody's got to fill up those affordable units and somebody's going to, uh, I think landlords know that they're going to have a hard time finding folks that may, may have blemishes on their credit. They may have issues that keep them from moving. And so uh, I think some of them will think, well, maybe a, a bird in a hand is better than, than losing it all. So hopefully that there, there'll be some uh, landlords out there that say, yeah, I'd like to keep my person in there. Maybe we'll tack on a little bit of money every month to get caught up somehow. But uh, I, I don't think that's anything that's going to be government mandated. It's going to have to be, you know, some uh, some education with the, the, our tenants and our landlords. Great, thanks. Um, now, education and tenant education is something all three of you mentioned. And I just want to get your thoughts on maybe how that can uh, go about during the crisis, you know, libraries are closed, community centers are closed, church services aren't being held anymore, schools are closed, these sort of pillars of communities where people can engage in dialogue and discuss about these issues are, are shut down and people are huddled in their homes. Um, any thoughts on how you can get the word out about some of these policies? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, and I think this is where we have the opportunity to use social media platforms. Um, potentially to to try to get the word out. Um, we're, as I say, the coalition working on um, some form of communication um, for a tenant education, landlord education, that we will send out to our members um, and we'll use our social media streams um, in the hopes that that information gets shared. Um, I think also um, having good partnerships with uh, local media is important. Um, we have good partnership with um, the media team and use the news um, teams here in Arizona. I think it's important to keep that line of communication open and um, to see if there's anything they can do to help to spread the word. Um, and also, I know um, community legal services here in Arizona are working on tenant educations um, and the AMA are working on landlord education. So, yeah, I think as long as um, well, you know, collectively um, understanding that the message is clear that we need education and communication. Um, I think it's really important that we just, as a community, try to get the word out in whatever way is possible. Great, thanks, Joanna. Uh, Amy, Dan, anything to add on, on that point? When it comes to um, education, I think something looking down the road for all of us is coming out of the foreclosure crisis, we saw 
um, significant funding that was needed for uh, foreclosure counseling programs, housing counseling programs. And I certainly expect that we may, you know, have that need certainly again, um, as it relates to mortgages. There are, we saw in the post foreclosure crisis that unless there was, you know, federal policies, um, there would be inconsistencies between the banks and how they did the loan modifications. And even those that were required under law, you sometimes need that qualified counselor to help you in navigating it with banks that were resistant to follow what they were supposed to do. So we certainly um, see a push and we would support that to get funds going again to those type of housing counseling programs because that has certainly dwindled off here in recent years and it's gonna become critical again, let alone the need for funding for legal services groups to help people in um, navigating maybe payment plans with their housing providers outside of potentially any direct payment that might be done at the federal level that we could certainly advocate on in trying to reach landlords for direct reimbursement as well. Um, can I just um, make an addition also to something that um, has just come to mind? Um, so the, the Arizona Housing Coalition, we're gonna be advocating for housing counseling um, in the next stimulus, federal stimulus package, um, so that um, those um, that are homeowners um, have the, the necessary support and resources available to them. Dan? Well, I, I think it's going to have to be some education and some outreach uh, on behalf of, of folks that um, are tenants that are getting moved out, where they can get help, how they can get help. And then also we need to really speak to the landlords at the same time and, and let them know that this, this is the situation. I think it's going to become a supply and demand uh, equation at some point in time, but I'm not sure when that will be. I do know when we had the crisis uh, with home ownership and the, the mortgage, the, 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 the banks were in trouble, um, you know, and, and lending for home ownership there was they were having a hard time lending they had more houses than they knew what to do with it and so uh eventually it settled out with supply and demand and it made some great opportunities for um for lower income folks to buy, buy in maybe neighborhoods they couldn't afford before uh, i don't know if that will be the case here but i do hope that we can get some that some of the federal assistance through the home program community development block grant and so forth can be used to kind of um, shore up some of those issues Great, thanks. And uh, now to broaden the conversation a little, Dan, I'd like to turn to something we talked briefly about over the phone earlier this week, and that's the issue of homelessness. Uh, I'd like to ask what's being done in Winston-Salem to help the homeless, homeless excuse me, population, population during this crisis. So we have a, a, a continuum of care folks that kind of grew out of the 10-year the plan in homelessness. Uh, it's led by the United Way, but they get with the agencies uh, periodically but lately they've been meeting daily and talking about the situation, how many beds are open, how many are, uh, folks are sick, or if there is anybody sick, direct them to the hospital. So they're, they're staying in constant communication uh, throughout this whole uh, ordeal. I will tell you that the county, uh, the health department, uh, our um, social services director and, and our, some of our staff are looking at possible places for the homeless to go if they uh, they fall victim to the virus. And so we're trying to look at uh, maybe possible old hotels that are somewhat vacant or vacant. We're looking at uh, old schools. We're looking at buildings. One of the things we're trying to do is, is find a place where each um, person can be contained in one unit with a bathroom. And so we are trying to figure out uh, what, what is out there that we might be able to acquire or not acquire, but make use of. And so um, we're getting closer and closer on that. We've looked at a few and, and so we're moving in. Hopefully we'll be able to find something in the next uh, two to three days. Joanna, I'd actually like to ask the same question of you as I know Phoenix and Maricopa County has a large homeless population as well. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of activity um, and Shelters at the moment are waiting direction from the governor's office to confirm how they may spend the, the $5 million allocation from the emergency state fund. 
Um, in the meantime, the governor has asked um, all shelters to provide a list of the supplies that are going to be required through December, um, and the state will be making a bulk order. Um, but while all that's been going on, um, there's been so much collaboration and activity and conversation as to how shelters and outreach teams could continue. Um, I mean, obviously, shelters unfortunately have had to reduce their bed capacity um, to ensure the, the adequate space um, for social distancing as best as they, they possibly can. Um, and as a result, Maricopa County um, has been working really hard to try to secure buildings um, for large scale quarantine. Um, I know that they were looking at the, the Coliseum um, and unfortunately that's not available. So looking at creative ideas such as sports stadiums, which I know other states around the nation um, with large homeless populations are, are looking at. Um, but we've also had an influx of hotels wanting to help um, because the hotel industry is obviously very um, weak at the moment. Um, and so I know Maricopa County are reaching out and we're also trying to um, sort of negotiate deals with hotels to pass along to our rapid rehousing providers that can provide eviction, uh, sorry, emergency housing assistance so that they can procure, procure some of those hotels. Um, otherwise, um, lots of other things going on, um, hand washing stations um, opening up the um, day centers so that residents can, uh, sorry, residents, um, unfortunately street homeless individuals can go in and at least wash their hands and use the facilities. Um, looking at um, temporary showering availability. Um, I know the Human Services Campus, which is the major coordinated entry site in Phoenix for the single side, um, has uh, managed to open up a 50 bed um, temporary shelter which didn't exist before um, and they're looking at also opening up a campsite, um, a structured campsite on, on their grounds, they're just waiting for permitting from the city of Phoenix. Um, outreach services are still operating with precaution, so for example um, rather than have um, outreach meetings in vehicles, they're conducting them outside of vehicles. There is an issue with transportation that's trying to be worked around. Um, and then outreach teams and shelters are partnering with um, health providers and health um, organizations to provide a triage system for COVID-19 assessment um, and treatment. Um, so yeah, I'd say really the, I see. I saw great work straight away from the really dedicated shelter to teams and outreach teams in collaborating and coming up with, with resources and I think there's great things going on and um, we're just anticipating what additional supports can be provided through this state fund and the federal stimulus bill. So. Great, thank you. Amy, anything to add on your end about the homeless situation in Indianapolis? We have some great homeless groups along with the Continuum of Care. They're doing some phenomenal work right now working with shelters. Uh, obviously, this is, a, uh, uh, this is a, a very vulnerable population and trying to navigate that. We've also had some extended stay hotels where uh, shelters are, are um, different advocacy groups are moving their people into as well. I think Joanna had mentioned the access through hotels. Um, but one of the barriers that we have seen there is some evictions that have been occurring within the hotels and whether or not that violates the governor's order on eviction moratoriums because it was a hotel that was essentially doing it. So that's something that advocates and individuals who work for the homeless groups have been trying to get some additional clearance on. But like Joanna said, a number of homeless groups here in Indianapolis are, are just doing some phenomenal work right now under some pretty tough um, conditions. Great, thanks. And Amy, I'd like to stay with you just for another question. Um, habitability issues and, and substandard housing, as you previously mentioned, in Indiana, Indianapolis rental units, uh, you know, inadequate heating, faulty ele electrical wiring, broken water pipes. That's been widely reported in the Indy Star and elsewhere over the past year or so. How do you see these issues affecting tenants following the statewide stay at home order? Well, we're hearing about that right now. Both our organization as well as legal services groups 
are hearing reports where um, emergency maintenance is not being done and the excuse is COVID. Um, yet these are typically the same bad actors who typically you know, don't do that type of maintenance um, traditionally as well. So that's in some ways given some of the bad actors an excuse when it comes to that. And then when it comes to just general maintenance, certainly um, that's being navigated between housing providers as well as tenants so that both parties you know, end up uh, being safe within that. But my worry is, again, like so much, COVID is just gonna exasperate you know, a problem that was already at a breaking point um, coming out of this. And what is going to happen when it comes to you know, sales? Um, businesses, including housing providers and landlords, you know, are, are struggling, you know, as well. And is this going to be an opportunity for, again, out-of-state investors to come in and scoop up property? Um, and we don't necessarily need any more. Uh, we really want to have, you know, local in-state ownership as much as we can, or some sort of local in-state property contact, because that certainly helps when it comes to trying to navigate those who do not fulfill their requirements as relates to substandard housing, code violations, and it, the list goes on. Great, thanks. And you're certainly not the only housing advocate in Indiana uh, talking about out-of-state property owners these days. Um, Dan, to turn to you for uh, the last question I have for you. Uh, so studies show that Winston-Salem and Forsyth County experienced some of the worst socioeconomic inequality in the country, unfortunately. And so in the long term, how do you see the pandemic affecting home ownership and renting, especially in marginalized communities? I, I, I think it will have a, a great effect on, on the uh, citizens and then the marginal communities. Uh, we have a housing stock that's pretty old in some, some situations and needs a lot of repair. Uh, we have a lot of down payment assistance programs through the county and the city that can that help out some folks. Uh, and our housing, I, I, I should say this, our housing um, prices, again, for home ownership were, were pretty low compared to other cities. But one of the problems that we've had in Winston Center Forsyth County is that our incomes, it's not really an affordability issue, it's more an issue of our residents not making enough money. We need, we need to have more jobs that pay uh, larger salaries so that folks can afford these homes. If you look at a trend over the years, uh, the housing prices have not gone up that much except maybe just the last six, seven months or maybe last year, but they've gone up quite a bit now. But before that, we were pretty much four or 5% along the way, and our, but our incomes had gone down quite significantly. And so one of the problems we have is we need to find better jobs for our citizens so that they can buy affordable housing. Um, so I think long term we, we're going to have some things to, to straighten out and, and hopefully we can attract some um, businesses that do pay higher wages and can uh, also build more affordable housing at the same time. There, there is a real gap in affordable housing here in Winston-Salem. I think some study says that it's like 14,000 units need to be built within uh, the next uh, five, six years and, and that's going to be a, a tough a tough road to do. Uh, I do think that we, we need to, to figure out how we can build more affordable housing, how we can make more, more land available for affordable housing, and that we have more water and sewer that can go to those folks so that we can build at higher densities. Great, thanks. And now before we transition to a bit of audience q and I'll end by asking all three of you uh, what more needs to be done. Start with Amy. I think that for us here in Indiana, uh, we need to look, we, here in Indiana, we do have a fairly healthy um, state reserve. Uh, you know, if this isn't a crisis, I don't know what else is. And for us to potentially, you know, look at what that might be and whether that is some sort of direct assistance um, for rent payments, uh, whatever else that might be. But this is a crisis, we've gotta be looking at that. At the federal level, same thing. Um, checks aren't going to be coming fast enough for most people who have bills to pay. Um, they've been out of job loss. Uh, people still gotta go buy groceries, even if they can hold off on paying rent. They've still gotta, you know, pay for other expenses. And one check is, is unlikely to be enough 
to get people you know through this crisis so you know advocating for that and understanding that and making sure you know those landlords are supported as well as part of this process with potentially said do we need to consider some form of direct payment um, that would assist those that may have tenants again through no fault of their own who can't pay rent anymore Thank you, Dan. I think it's, it's going to be interesting. We'll have to see as, as this plays out how many people did lose their homes, how many people are, are uh, going to be left in the street, and, and how that all plays out. Also, how much the federal money can make a difference, but also locally. I know, like I said, I think earlier before that uh, our community has come up with $3 million to assist families that are, are being affected by this. and. Uh, we do have a strong community that really helps each other out. So I think that's one of the things we have to look within ourselves uh, as we go on. But again, we, we are going to need that continued federal assistance to, to get folks housed in affordable housing. And um, how we do that will, will uh, determine our future. Um, and for Arizona, um, I think really importantly is that we need to ensure that we coordinate efforts between um, the federal um, and the state entities to ensure that we are using the state funds that are coming in to some supplement um, and not supplant the federal funds. Um, and we also need ongoing transparency um, and clarity on how the funds can be deployed and used on the ground. Um, I think short term, most definitely protection for um, our most vulnerable. Um, we need to make sure our shelters and frontline staff have all of the supplies that they need and that those that are street living have adequate space um, and hygiene items um, through this crisis. Um, and I think also uh, looking at the long term, um, I think it's really important that we ensure that once the dust settles that we continue our advocacy efforts around affordable housing because um, I mean, like Dan said, we're not really going to know exactly how this is going to look um, once this is over, whenever that may be. Um, but certainly we had a, a, a serious crisis before and we need to make sure that um, our state um, representatives um, don't kind of lose the wheel on that and we make sure that um, that still remains a clear priority. Great. Thank you all. And we'll uh, turn to a few of the questions that uh, the viewers have been uh, submitting over this conversation. The first one is for Dan. Um, the question is about uh, the projected shortfall of affordable housing units in Winston-Salem. Uh, it's as high as 16,000 units projected, um, according to the mayor. And the uh, just the viewer wants to ask how this can be mitigated in, in the short term amid the crisis and then in the long term. Dan, I think you muted yourself by accident. Uh, I think in the short term, it's going to be difficult. You know, we're going to have some situations that come up that we're going to have to figure out how to handle. I think in the long run, we have to build more affordable units. And I think we have to build at a higher density and we need more mixed income neighborhoods. Uh, some people have been talking about going vertical with housing, uh, not just uh, going out and, and spread out, but more in a, a vertical situation so that you may have three or four story uh, units. Uh, we have been successful in Forsyth County in getting some tax credit projects that have been, have been very helpful. Uh, and the North Carolina Housing Finance Agency has played a big role in that. We have a good uh, housing finance agency that provides money for home ownership and for rental too, and are, are, are very active in our community. So I think we have to look at all our resources. You know, I know some communities uh, end up having bonds just for housing set aside. And I think the city of Winston-Salem did that some years ago. And, and that may be a, something that is looked at, at by local governments here. So. I think that's kind of, um, there's going to be able to have to be a lot of issues. The private sector is going to have to step up too and, and figure out um, how they can build more affordable housing, but do it in a, in a mixed income kind of way. Uh, whether that's higher density or going vertical is, is things that we need to figure out. Great, thanks. And the second question is addressed to all of the panelists, but Amy, I'll direct it at you first. So we're hearing 
questions from small landlords, smaller operators who would require rental assistance to keep homes safe or maintained in the face of a moratorium. And they'd like to ask if there's any advice on how to engage these good actors in the provider management space to advocate for assistance while protecting tenants. Yeah, I think it's very, um, so often we hear only about the bad actors. Um, those are the stories that certainly make the news or that we hear about. And there's, we don't hear about the good actors, those wonderful um, opportunities. We know there are landlords in our community who are working with their tenants and understand what this crisis is. And those are the landlords we need to support, as I mentioned, for some way to make sure that they're able to also pay their bills um, needs to be looked at as part of that. Finding that is certainly, you know, part of our struggle though, um, finding them, locating um, them as part of that. There are, here in Indiana, we have a couple efforts in different cities of creating tenant unions. And very often those are able to, you know, find those landlords because, uh, you know, working with them and identify them, you know, as part of that. Uh, and it's our hope that something like that will also be able to take off. And the other thing that I wanted to point out as well is this is also a tremendous opportunity for those who are using vouchers uh, to get rented to. We have a huge voucher denial rate here in, Indi in Indiana and in Indianapolis in particular. And here is a form of guaranteed rent coming in that's being paid directly from the government. And it's an opportunity to make sure that our voucher households that have struggled so often in the past have an opportunity to get housed and that housing provider has that guaranteed rent coming in as well. Joanna? Um, yeah, that's a great point, Amy. Um, I think it's um, certainly an opportunity to engage our landlords. I, I think we're in a time where um, landlords are severely impacted by this and, and it's very uncertain times for them also. And um, I think we've got to take into consideration that landlords um, in a lot of cases are going to want to hold on to their tenants. Um, so I think I like your idea, Amy, about um, sort of engaging landlords um, to fill that gap that we've been trying to fill for the holders. But also I think that there's room here for the um, conversation around landlord tenant education and opening the lines of communication. Um, I think if we can engage those landlords and provide them with um, really useful objective information about the resources um, and protections that are available to them alongside the um, resources and protections that may be available to their tenants then um, hopefully um, together with um, both of those angles we can protect or work to protect both the landlord and the tenant to make sure that um, we're, we are keeping our existing affordable housing stock or just housing stock in general. Dan, anything to add on your end? I, uh, we, we used to have, uh, for home ownership, I, I'm more involved with home ownership than rental housing. The county doesn't do rental. We have a housing authority uh, and the city has a, a, some programs for rental housing. Uh, the ones we have been dealt with have been in tax credit deals. But I know some years ago, we, we had a, a group that was the, the, uh, a group that would buy land that, that was set up to just go out and buy land and hold that land, develop it, and then turn around and sell it, the lots off to developers or builders. And so that it, it was a savings that was passed on on the supply side of it. Uh, so I, I think one of those things is we need to start looking at more nonprofit housing. Our, our, uh, our Habitat for Housing has done a really good job here in Winston-Salem of built tremendous neighborhoods and so forth, but we need more efforts in, in from our, our community development corporations. It'd be great to have uh, folks that were nonprofit that actually had builder, you know, contractor builders that were working for nonprofits that could actually build houses for uh, uh, a less expensive uh, amount. So. I think there's going to be a lot of different strategies that are going to have to, to be done. And it's not something new. We've always um, talked about affordable housing in the United States. And it's, it's something that's just not going to stop now, but it's going to be exas exasperated. So, Great. Thanks. And I, I think we have time for one more question. So this one touches upon landlord-tenant relationships and really the power dynamic uh, between landlords and tenants, which 
many find has only gotten worse in this crisis. And this question is just about what, what's the messaging that you go to uh, landlords with during this crisis to get them, to get them help with uh, renter protection and sort of easing back on evictions and things like that during this crisis. Amy, I'll start with you. There's probably going to have to be a combination of things on that. One is there may have to be some sort of um, incentive or uh, a continuation of some sort of order uh, that's issued potentially by you know the courts or maybe through an executive order of maybe possibly mandating that when we come out of the eviction moratorium or the foreclosure moratorium, which we also have here in Indiana, that there's some requirement that if the non-rental period clearly happened due to COVID, that there's a requirement that there be some sort of mediation or arbitration, you know, as part of that, instead of going directly to eviction court and going down, you know, that particular process to try to, you know, navigate that or make that easier for our legal services groups who are also trying to navigate that for the tenants as well. Um, I'll let Joanna, since we're running out of time, I'll also let Joanna. Yeah, I think um, on top of those ideas, I think most definitely um, clarity in, um, you know, mentioned before the, the resources that are available both to the landlord and the tenant um, I think that there's a lot of confusion sort of on both ends um, and a lot of confusion around the federal stimulus until we receive um, clearer guidance. And I think, um, you know, landlords are panicking, tenants are panicking. And I think that we need um, most definitely um, transparency in the support that is available to the landlords. Um, and I guess a, a message of, of unity um, that, I mean, I, I guess we, we need to value our landlords in this time. Um, we, we need to um, make sure that we are doing everything that we can to maintain the, the housing stock that they're providing to our, our tenants um, alongside um, obviously protecting the tenants and making sure that they keep their home. Um, and so I guess a message of unity is important in this time. Dan, anything to add in our last minute? Yeah, I, I would uh, speak to the second Joanna's um, conversation. I, I would say that we can't afford to um, to lose our landlords. You know, we saw when, when we had the other crisis, when, when we had people losing their homes, people would walk away, landlords would walk away. Uh, there was uh, folks that were working on houses, stopped in the middle of them, walked away, their hammer still on the house. Uh, we need landlords and landlords have, have there have been good ones and there's been lots of them here in Winston-Salem. But I think maybe what we could also talk about is maybe set up a mediation board that would meet and talk about the landlord and the tenant and see if they can work out some agreements that the landlord could be made uh, not completely whole, but whole enough that they could continue to rent out. And uh, hopefully if they've had a good renter, I would, if I was a renter or a tenant, a tenant I would want to have that, that, renter back in there because they know they've made payments over the years and through no fault of their own, they've lost their job, they, they can't go to work. Uh, as, as a landlord, um, I know I got to get some money, so I, I would try to work out a deal where I could get some of my money back and start fresh uh, from there on out. So I think there's room for mediation and, and, and conversations between the two. Great, uh, thank you. Now, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would like to thank all of our viewers and extend a special thanks to our three panelists uh, for their time and insights. Amy, Dan, and Joanna, thanks so much for joining me today for this conversation. I uh, hope everyone watching continues to stay safe and healthy. Uh, so bye for now. <laughs>